Hello world, I'm Benjamin and this is Source Decoded. Welcome to part three of JavaScript is Easy. I grew up with sheep. I mean, I grew up in a family with people and everything, but my family raised sheep. Every spring we would lamb the sheep and then we'd raise the lambs all summer and then sell them for meat in the fall. You might think that that means that as a youth I ate a lot of super fancy lamb for dinner, um, but that's really not the case. We couldn't eat the lamb because that was the merchandise. We had to sell it. It's not that we didn't eat sheep, but the sheep we ate were the ones that were so old that they couldn't have lambs anymore. When the sheep couldn't make more sheep and we couldn't sell it, then we ate it. In terms of flavor, it really wasn't bad. Uh, but I can tell you that a nine-year-old mutton that spent her whole life walking up and down the mountain and to and from the various pastures makes for really tough meat. I wouldn't be surprised if my pioneer ancestors were each given a hunk of mutton in Missouri and chewed that same piece all the way across the plains until they got to the Salt Lake Valley. The stuff will just chew forever. But this tough, stringy old meat taught me an important lesson, and that is that with big jobs, it's important to take small bites. Taking a big bite of tough meat is not more efficient. If there's a slice of mutton standing between you and roasting a marshmallow over the fire pit in grandma's backyard, and you take a big bite, you're gonna be chewing that until the fire has gone cold. Small bites are the way to go. So you may feel like through this course, we're taking it really slow, but I think it's better to learn these things one piece at a time, taking small bites. Many people learn to program kind of willy-nilly with everything out of order, and they do fine. In fact, that's kind of how I learned. I'm self-taught, and I just kind of poked around and figured stuff out. However, I think I could have learned a lot faster if somebody had presented things to me in an order that made sense and allowed me to build piece by piece on a solid foundation. So if you feel like this is taking a long time, hang in there. Besides, this is YouTube. You can binge watch these as fast as you want. So why don't we get to the meat of this video? We have previously discussed values like numbers and strings. And values are important and we need them, but what's even cooler is when you can give a name to a value. Say you want to calculate the sales tax of some things for sale in a store, and the sales tax rate where you live is 6%. So you have this value, 0.06. And it is a value, but it has a purpose. It has a meaning. And what if you could give it a name and say that sales tax is 0.06? Well, you can. In JavaScript, you could do that like this. Const sales tax equals 0.06. This tells JavaScript that we're declaring a constant. Have you ever seen a movie where there's a big fancy party like a ball going on and as people walk into the room there's somebody standing at the door in a powdered wig saying presenting the Earl of Sandwich or whatever. That announcer is essentially declaring people as they come into the room so the people who are at the party know that that guy who just walked in that value is the Earl of Sandwich. You've attached a label to that thing. That's what we're doing here when we declare a constant. Now the fact that we're declaring a constant means that this label can only ever represent this one value. Sales tax will always mean 0.06 for the life of this program or in this scope. So as we look at this line, we see const. This means we're declaring a constant. Sales tax is the label we want to give it. This equals sign is actually an operator. It's not the comparison operator because there's only one equal sign. It's the assignment operator and it takes two inputs. It takes the input on the right, a value, and assigns it to the label that you provide on the left, sales tax. And finally, we have this semicolon here. The semicolon in JavaScript, in this case, means that we've reached the end of a statement, which is like a sentence. It means that this particular instruction is over, and we're getting ready to move on to the next one. You will sometimes see JavaScript that is written without these semicolons, and that's technically legal, but there is some specific cases where you do actually have to have a semicolon. And because I don't wanna to have to remember exactly what those rules are, I tend to just use the semicolons all the time anyway. But opinions differ on that. Okay, now that the value 0.06 has a name, what can we do with it? Let's walk into our imaginary store and uh, define some posted prices of some things that we might like to buy. For example, const 
sugary cereal costs a $5.99. And a pizza will cost $8.50. And finally, we'll pick up an electric car today for $42,000. Okay, so now we have some more constants defined. We know what the sales tax is and we know what the posted price of these things are. Now let's figure out what the total price is gonna be with sales tax. The sugary cereal total is going to be the price of sugary cereal plus the price of sugary cereal times sales tax. And then similar thing for the other two. Okay, so now we have constants defined for all of these things. Notice how when we did the math, we can stand in one of these labels for the actual value. Now when we want to know what any of those things cost, we can just say, what is sugary cereal total? What is the electric car total? 44520 now in this case, it's safe to use constants because in the short life of this program, the price of cereal or the sales tax rate is not likely to change. But there are cases when we want to declare a label for something that will change. Imagine you're at your fancy party and you sit down to eat with the Earl of Sandwich and after the waiter comes and takes your order, he goes on a break or the shift changes and you're assigned a new waiter. At that point, the label waiter is now pointing to a different person. So in JavaScript terms, it might look something like this. The waiter, first of all, is Steven, and then the shift changes. So now the waiter is going to be Phil. Now you notice when I declared this label, I didn't use the word const, I used the word let. Let declares a variable or a label that can change. Let's go back to our sales tax example. Say you wanted to keep a running total of the things that you were about to buy as you were walking through the store. We'd first declare it, let total equal zero, and then let's put the sugary cereal into our cart. Total equals our previous total plus the sugary cereal total. And now let's uh, put the pizza into, the, into our cart. Total equals the previous total plus the pizza total. I should use semicolons. And finally, the electric car. As you, you'll notice as we go through here that the value of total changes. First it was 60, 635 essentially, and now it's 15 and change. Now we can say total equals our previous total plus the price of the electric car. And now that's how much total money we're going to spend. Now, when we declare something like this, const, let's say, uh, carrots and the carrots cost a straight up dollar. We're doing two things at once. We're declaring a new label called carrots and we're putting a value in it. When you're declaring constant, you have to assign it a value right away. That's called initialization. We have to initialize carrots with the value that it's going to represent. But when you're declaring variables with let, uh, let healthy total, um, you can just do the declaration and then start assigning it a value later. Healthy total equals zero. That's totally legal, but really most of the time uh, I end up initializing my variables when I declare them. And then finally, I'll just demonstrate that if I try to assign a new value to carrots, uh, I'm going to have an error. But if I assign a new value to healthy total, uh, it works fine because carrots is a constant and let gives us a variable. There's actually another way to declare a variable using the var keyword. Var is older than let in const. It was original to JavaScript. So I can say, var, oh, I'm running out of things to buy. Uh, camera is gonna cost me 500 bucks. And in most ways it works the same as let, but var kind of falls into the same category as the double equals that we talked about before. There's nothing really broken about it, 
but it does have some special rules that can make it confusing to deal with. In the case of var though, you could probably use it through your whole JavaScript career and only run into this special case where it becomes a problem once or twice. Even so, I recommend you pretend that var doesn't exist and stick with const and let, unless you understand the fancy lexical scoping rules that apply to the var keyword. Okay, let's wrap up by addressing one final question. We've talked about constants and variables. How do you know when to use which? My advice on this is pretty simple. Always start with constants and then only use variables if you absolutely have to. Now this might seem strange given that the variable is obviously the more powerful of the two options, but the habit of always reaching for the most powerful tool you can find to solve a particular problem tends to get you in trouble as a programmer. The world that we work in is already so complex and vast that anything that you can do to reduce the cognitive load that you have to carry around in your brain is going to help you out. Really the only time you should be using a variable is when you have a legitimate need for that label to change values like in the example of our waiter or the running total of things that we were going to buy at the store. In practice, I probably declare 30 or 40 constants for every variable that I use. They're really pretty rare in my code. Think of it this way. In your kitchen, you have a lot of tools. You've got silverware and spatulas and pots and pans and hopefully an ice cream scoop. Where are your pots and pans right now besides in the sink waiting to be washed? I mean, where do they belong? Where do they go? And where were they yesterday? And where will they be tomorrow? Chances are you keep them in the same place so that you know where to find them. But isn't that restricting? Wouldn't you rather have the freedom of saying, my philosophy is to put my pots and pans wherever I happen to feel like it. Can you imagine what cooking would be like if you never knew for sure what was in this cupboard or where your spatula was? You would end up using a lot of time looking for stuff that you could be using doing actual cooking. And the same thing goes in programming. If you can give a name to something and then leave it alone, your job is easier. You will never have to think about if sales tax refers to the Utah or the Oregon sales tax rate right now. If you need to track both of those things, just declare two constants. They don't cost very much at all and they won't make your program slower. It will though make you faster. Don't do things that make your job harder. That's all we're going to cover on this one. I really enjoy reading your comments, especially ones that have questions about things that I might not have explained very well or stuff that I missed. Thank you for watching. You'll see me in the next one.